Hi, my name is Melissa Franklin. I uh, teach in the physics department, and I actually introduce a lot of these lectures. Um, and I uh, ran into our speaker uh, about a, six months or a year ago, and I heard her talk, and it was so good that I just wanted to bring her here. Um, she uh, is Italian, which is, OK, that's good. I hope. And then, uh, she grew up, near, she grew up near, near Pisa, which is a, it has a tower there, and uh, and a little bit of the leaning part. Huh? Uh, and then she went to university at Pisa, and graduate school at Pisa, and she worked on a, 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 a one of the first uh, gravitational wave experiments uh, in Pisa, <laughs> in Marina di Pisa. No, where is it? Gosh, you know. Okay. Okay, and then uh, called Virgo, and then she got her PhD, and then she flew across the ocean to MIT, and from then she's been at MIT the whole time, now as a senior scientist there, or something like that, uh, working on uh, and working on the LIGO experiment, which is a beautiful, beautiful experiment. I'm sure you've heard about it a little bit, a gravitational wave experiment. I just want to let you know that she just arrived here on the plane from uh, NASA, where she was giving a talk. So you see, did, did you give a talk this morning? No. Yeah, it, yeah. Yes. It, it, so, see, this is very cool. So you are now cool. <laughs> <laughs> the same person giving a talk at NASA, who they wanted to hear from, giving a talk to you. So it's very exciting. Is this a good introduction so far? Wow, yeah, well, extremely. <laughs> you something? I really like this person, so I want to hear her talk. After the talk, you, we're going to have questions, and then uh, after that, if you still have questions, you can come up and, and uh, approach the podium. Okay, great. You have a lever, Lewis, so I can turn this off. Yeah. yeah, this is one of the interesting introductions <laughs> I ever had. <laughs> uh, thank you. <laughs> no, in, a, in a good way, I mean, I mean, in a good way. <laughs> All right, thank you very much for coming. Um, really excited to have all of you here. Uh, so today I'm going to tell you a story, which is the story of how in the last um, few decades we have learned uh, a new way to look at the universe. Uh, and this new way uh, doesn't use only light and telescopes, but use new type of waves, not electromagnetic waves, but gravitational waves and new type of instruments that are able to detect these waves. Um, so this is really a story, and as all of the stories, we start from the very beginning. Uh, and the very beginning is not working. I, sorry, I thought I tested a second ago. OK, let's do it this way. Um, so the very beginning is a long, long time ago, so in the 1600s. And this is Newton, and this is the apple. And I think this is a familiar image for, uh, for many of you. Uh, so Newton formulated a theory of gravity, which says that if you have two objects, each with a mass, m1 and m2, uh, the gravitational force between these two masses is proportional to the masses and then it goes as one over the distance square. This, this law has been working fine for uh, several centuries, and no one had any problem with it, um, except one person. It doesn't work, so I need to do it. Um, Einstein. So Einstein's problem was that in the previous formulation of the gravitational wave interaction, what happens is that imagine this is a, an object, mass m1, and this is me, object, mass 2. And now I move, right? The distance between these two objects changes. And so the gravitational wave force between these two objects also changes. But it cannot be instantaneous, right? It needs to, you know, it takes some time for that object to know that I moved. And somehow the simple formula that I showed you earlier didn't have encoded uh, anything that said at which speed 
this information was uh, propagated between the object. Now, you might, like, I think I would have slept fine even with this plot problem, and I, I think most of you would have slept just fine as well. Uh, but Einstein actually thought, okay, there is something wrong here. Uh, this uh, understanding of gravity is not, is not right. Um, and so he formulated his own theory, uh, which is the general theory, uh, theory of general relativity, and I'm sure you all heard about it. Uh, the actual, the equations of this theory is very complicated, and I certainly don't want to write them here. Uh, but there is a nice way of summarizing what the general relativity says, uh, which is uh, mass tells space-time how to curve, and space-time tells the mass how to move. And so now, in between our masses, it's not just the important parameter is not just the distance between us, but it's the space-time in between us. And then what happens is that if I move, at that point is I change the space-time in between me and the other object, and then the information, ah, oh, thank you, great. And then the information, uh, according to this theory, travels at the speed of light. So Einstein was happy uh, with this. Um, and, uh, and then after Einstein, many people have thought about the implications of this theory. Uh, and there, are in, there is, in particular, uh, an implication that is interesting. Uh, one is the existence of black holes. When you introduce this concept of space-time, now, there could be regions in this space-time from which nothing can escape, no matter, no light, nothing. And those are black holes. And the incredible thing is that the black holes come directly from solving the equation of Einstein's in a particular way. The other implications, is still coming directly from the equation, is the existence of these gravitational waves uh, that propagates at the speed of light. And these gravitational waves are generated any time there is a, a, a change in the mass distribution of this object. Now, me and that thing over there wouldn't be able to produce really gravitational waves, but if you had um, astrophysical objects, like two, for example, two black holes in the sky that orbit around each other, and then at some point they merge, and as they merge, the mass distribution change a lot, and, and something like that, according to, the, uh, to Einstein, could exist. Einstein and the many people who, you know, elaborated on this theory afterwards. Um, so then, uh, you know, okay, so now we have this theory. Uh, according to this theory, something like this is, would, would be possible. Let's see if you can see it. Still doesn't work, I'm sorry. Oh no, he does, but wait. Sorry, technology is failing me. I um sorry. I have a movie here. Oh, I need to do it like that. Okay. Um unfortunately the black holes are black. Oh no, it's really no no, it's really not not working. Uh Sorry, I we tested earlier and it seemed everything seemed fine. Um, can we take a yeah. minute? I have several movies, so if it doesn't if it doesn't work, uh, it's just not not going. Wow, you know, it, something should happen. No, no, I, this is um, yeah, yeah. It's on my computer. Yeah, I'm sorry, this never happened to me, so. Um, it's not just the sound, it doesn't look like it's showing the video at all. I hope I have nothing compromising on my desktop. <laughs> It's not going. Okay, well, let's see. Now it's fun. I'll try to reproduce. 
Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to reproduce this video. Uh, wow, we are also, we are recording all of this, right? Okay. Okay, okay. so um, can you help me for a second? Very good. Okay, so we are two black holes, okay? And now we rotate like this. Uh, well, let's come here, so let's, let's do it right, okay? <laughs> All right, so we go this way, okay? So we are, let's go slow, you know, we are two black holes and we are rotating and we, we go like this. And then at some point we start losing energy and we lose energy as gravitational waves uh, and we come closer and closer. And then well, as we come closer, actually, sorry, we go faster like this. Yeah, uh, now it is, yeah, sorry, got it. <laughs> Like this, keep going. And then at some point we merge. Whoa, 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 okay, yeah. Now we have merged and we made one black hole. And in this process, thank you. Of course. In this process, what happens is, I, I think I'm fine. Now I'm, I, now I'm a single black hole here. And what had happened is that in the process of going faster and faster, like more gravitational waves have been emitted and the frequency of the gravitational waves change in the process. And now uh, these gravitational waves propagate. And now if we could see the movie, uh, you would see something like uh, you have, imagine you are on a, on a pond and you throw a stone and then you see all the waves in the stone. And that's pretty much the same thing. Imagine that the collision between us was the stone in the lake, and then all the gravitational waves that propagate. Now, this image is not totally correct in the sense that the way it actually goes is like this. Those are the black holes uh, that rotate, and then this is the direction of propagation. So if we rotate in this plane, the gravitational waves propagate in this plane. And what happens as we propagate, as they propagate, uh, this is space, right? The space stretches in one direction and get it, sorry, stretch in this direction and squeezes in this direction. I pick this one, so I get taller and thinner, that's the opposite way. Uh, and, that, uh, and this is happens to everything that the gravitational waves uh, see. Now this movie actually what it shows is these this black holes colliding, and then the waves, and then there is the Earth. And so when the waves arrive at the Earth, in what we would see in principle uh, is the Earth kind of stretching in one direction and squeezing in the other, right? So that's the idea of what the theory of Einstein tells us. Um, so, Wow, nothing really works. None of my movies. Well, this is really, really strange. None of them. <laughs> I'm so sorry, this would have been a great talk with my movies. Uh, and now, well. I, we, we tried one of them, uh, not all of them. Uh, one was working just fine. Uh, yeah, okay. I don't know, maybe let's see if uh, the, our expert here, I can keep talking and embarrass myself. That, that right? Okay. Not sure, but um, anyway, so uh, all of this uh, would, would give you uh, important insight, which is, um, let's assume that Einstein is right and there are these objects like black holes that merge in the sky, in the universe. Uh, and then there are gravitational waves that propagate from this object and reach the Earth, right? So in the 50s, uh, um, many people started thinking, okay, can we actually measure these waves? And can we use the fact that they stretches a space time in one direction and squeezes in the other as a way of actually having an indication for uh, you know, what, what's the, what are the properties of this source or where is actually the source in the universe? Um, and now there is a, a, a problem with that. And the problem is that uh, if you actually solve Einstein's equation for, for example, 
the black hole system that we just did, in which you take typical, let's say, parameters of, of two black holes. Um, what happens is that the amplitude of the gravitational waves, and therefore the stretching and squeezing of space-time, is very, very small, incredibly small. Um, and so on this slide here, uh, you see that, um, for example, if you put, OK, the laser pointer works. Uh, imagine that you have four uh, objects like this in space. And then gravi the gravitational waves arrive, and imagine it ent it's entering uh, the, uh, the screen here. Uh, what, it would, what the gravitational wave would do, it would uh, squeeze the space-time in this direction and stretch it in the other. And so it would appear as if the distance between these two objects get reduced and the distance between these two get, uh, get longer. Okay? And now you can correlate uh, the amplitude of the gravitational waves with the, the stretching and squeezing effect. And now, as in one second, we go back to that slide. Uh, you can actually do the math and say, OK, if the amplitude of my gravitational waves with typical parameters is actually of the order of 10 to the minus 21, like it's 1 with 21 zeros in front of it. Um, and now you say, let's, let's assume that I put this my two objects something like a kilometer apart. So now you have uh, the, 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 this, the changing the distance between this object that you need to measure is 10 to the minus 10, 21 times one kilometer, which is 10 to the minus 18 meter. So even if you have two black holes colliding in the universe and they produce gravitational waves as Einstein told us, the, on the Earth, for typical sources that we think could exist, we, you will need, need to be able to measure something of the order of 10 to the minus 18 meter. Still not working. Eh? OK. Uh, OK. I need to give another talk at some other time. <laughs> eh? Sorry? No, I don't have it. Can you? That's fine. Look, uh, this is going to be fun, because there was also some um, uh, sound. And so this will become very interesting. Uh, anyway, so this is the, what I want to tell you, is that the amplitude of the waves, uh, based on Einstein theory and reasonable parameters, 10 to the minus 21. Let's imagine that you put this object at a distance of approximately uh, uh, one kilometer. What you need to measure is something like this, 10 to the minus 18 meters. Now, there are many ways in which we try to impress the public and say how small 10 to the minus 18 meter is. So uh, one way of thinking about this is like, if, if you want, if, it's like you want to try to measure the distance between us and the closest star with the accuracy of the thickness of a human hair. It's, it's incredible. Um, and 10 to the minus 18 is one, um, thousands the radius of a proton. So it's something very small that you want. It's a change in the distance between st these objects so small that you want to try to measure uh, over you know, kilometer distance. And, and the point is that you need to put this object very far apart, because the f if you put them far apart, then this number becomes bigger. And at least your 10 to the minus 18 <laughs> becomes a bit bigger. But obviously, on Earth, it's kind of hard to you know, put it at an infinite distance. So kilometer scale is what we've been, uh, you know, it's a reasonable, uh, it's as big as it can get, let's put it this way. So the question that people have been asking themselves for many, many years was like, OK, how can we actually measure this 10 to the minus 18 meter? So we went from a very new, uh, innovative, amazing theory uh, that produced, a, you know, that has this prediction that, and it was giving us a tool to actually be able to measure 
uh, this thing, and then the problem is like, great, okay, we have this theory, and now practically, how are you actually going to measure 10 to the minus 18 meters? Okay, so unfortunately, this move is also not going to play, I'm afraid. Yeah, right, okay. So what you would see here uh, is uh, an example of how you can actually make this measurement. And this idea uh, comes from many people, but the first person who actually put everything together is Professor Weiss uh, at MIT. This is a... a few decades ago. Uh, so uh, the idea is to use a laser source, so something like my pointer, but way more stable uh, and powerful. And then now, since we don't have a video, imagine that your laser beam is produced, and so you have some light that goes to this. And here you put a mirror, and you split the light in two parts. Half of the light goes this way, and half goes this way. And now at the end of these two arms, you put some mirrors that are done very carefully such that they can reflect all the lights that comes toward them. Um, and so what happens is that, great, you do that, and then you control the relative distance of this mirror such that, that there is no light coming this way. Okay? And you do that, and that works, great. And now what happens is that then your gravitational waves arrive, and start stretching and squeezing the space-time. And so what you would see is then that the relative distance between these two mirrors and these two mirrors changes. And as it changes, some of the light leaks toward this side. Okay? And as the light, so then here you put an object that is able to convert light photons in current, and then you can actually look at a signal that it generates, and uh, the change in the, uh, in the light at this port encodes the property of the stretching and squeezing of the space-time, and therefore the property of the gravitational waves that was produced. I apologize again because the movie would have made that extremely clear, but uh, I hope you got the, the message. Great. So, uh, This is uh, just to show you the original uh, idea from Professor Weiss. And this is, uh, uh, is actually, uh, he actually published this um, uh, in a progress report at MIT in 1972. And here you see the beam splitter, the laser is coming uh, from this side. You see a beam splitter and you see the two mirrors and here it was, it was starting to think about how you would combine the signal uh, that you get. And he understood, in particular, that if you want to do this, you need to put your mirrors, uh, first of all, try as much as possible to isolate them from the ground. If they're attached to the ground, the ground shakes too much. There is no way you're going to measure 10 to the minus 18 meter change in the distance between these objects. So that's the first thing that he understood. The second thing is that you need to put your mirrors in an ultra-high vacuum system. Uh, otherwise, you know, if you add air in between, there is no, again, there is no way you're going to be able to measure that tiny, tiny distance. And so what happened is that uh, Professor Weiss and then other people got together and started thinking that this was actually a good idea. Um, and then they, uh, they uh, made a proposal to the uh, National Science Foundation to actually build two uh, interferometers, that's the name for the laser and the mirrors, uh, two interferometers and make them as big as possible. Uh, and, and so they, they are four kilometers each arm. Uh, and uh, the NSF actually uh, funded the project and they, um, they started building these observatories in, in 1994, and it took about six years. So LIGO stands for Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, and there are two of those. One is in Washington State, in the Hanford uh, here, in the desert, and the other one is in Louisiana, uh, the Livingston, in Livingston. Here you see the jungle around, so it's very easy to uh, from the picture to know which one is which. Uh, the key feature of these facilities are that, as I said, 
as, as big as possible, so four kilometers, shaped as an L. Uh, and they, this is an ultra-high vacuum system. So then after the construction of this facility, people put in laser mirrors and I start to take data. They operate, as I ex explained before, in such a way that you don't have any light going to your main photo detector. So uh, nothing is going there. If there is a gravitational wave, you would expect to see some light. So these detectors operated for about eight years. No light at the photo detector had been seen, so no detection, despite the fact that these instruments actually operated as expected. So that means that they were not sensitive enough. So the amplitude of the wave is so small that even with the four kilometer instrument and the type of technology that you put in your detector, that didn't work. Ah, okay. But how did you get my... Are you... Ah, okay. Okay. Trying to copy everything. Yeah, sorry for the, we really tested before, so I don't know what happened. Um, uh, so the other thing I want to say is that not only these uh, instruments were, not only this facility and the instruments were built, but also a large group of people from all around the world uh, started to be part of this, uh, of this adventure to find the waves, and in particular, uh, um, I want to mention what we call the LIGO scientific collaboration. And now there are about uh, 1,200 uh, people all around the world that work to uh, you know, maintain the observatories and, and um, uh, analyze the data. Sorry? Uh, this one? <laughs> this one. Yeah. yeah, okay. Okay, so uh, the story continues in this way. One could say, well, you didn't see anything. It means maybe your, uh, either your theory is wrong or your instruments are not good enough. End of the story. But no, because wisely, the National Science Foundation had already invested in an upgrade of these detectors. And so uh, at that point, uh, oh, this works. So you are blaming on my computer, is that? Ah, uh, let's see if they work. No. No, still not working. Ah, uh, uh, okay, yeah. Uh, so, the National Science Foundation had already uh, approved the upgrade of this instrument. So in, in 2010, uh, the facilities remained the same. This is the one in uh, Hanford, uh, Washington State. Uh, the facility remained the same, but everything inside, inside this building got changed. So the laser, which was here, was replaced with a much more powerful laser. The mirrors, which are here, four kilometers away and here, uh, were also replaced to make them uh, to make them better, and the and the way in which, in particular, the way in which they were isolated for, from the ground was greatly improved. And so, with this new uh, detector, uh, this is the Livingston one, which again looks pretty much the same. The laser is here, and the and the mirror, the split the lights is here, and the other two mirrors are down there. Uh, the new instrument. Uh, way more powerful than before, uh, looked like this. And in particular, this is a picture of your mirror, which is here. And this mirror is free to move because it's suspended through a, a, a sequence of, of pendulum here. This is your laser. There are more mirrors than in the original design because it turns out that you needed 
uh, way more light than the laser could produce. And the way in which you do that is by sending the light back and forth uh, pretty much between the mirrors. Uh, but anyway, the point is that these new detectors came online in 2015. And exactly September 12 on 2016. OK. Yeah. So now we are creating the, the spans for what's happening. So <laughs> the instruments came online uh, September 12, um, 2015. And I have, OK, let's, the, the story here is that very few people in this large collaboration of you know, 1,200 people thought that we would detect anything at that point. Because these new instruments, even if way more powerful than before, are just uh, like not really working, uh, not very, working very well. Or not work, I think they were working well, but not as well as they could. Uh, so we were, just to give you a sense, we were operating at less the sensitivity, less than a factor of two the sensitivity that they could actually achieve. The way in which I like to think about this is like, I have a Ferrari, but I'm going uh, 50 miles an hour. I don't try to go you know, super fast. And that's how we started uh, with, with these detectors. The incredible thing is that just three days after these detectors were up and running, um, something was recorded at the same time in these two detectors, exactly the same signal. Um, and now, if the, if the movie is not there, now I need to kind of do the sound. Because, so the, the important thing is that these detectors operate in the audio band. So the nice thing is that you remember the light that goes to your photo detector. If you actually translate that in the current, then you can actually play the signal um, uh, on your speaker. And so the, the, the signal has a very, a peculiar feature, which is, uh, wow, now you're hacking in my. <laughs> wow. It, yeah. No, no, they're, they're all embedded in PowerPoint. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so the sound is like this something like that, okay? Very sh it's actually, I cannot do the real one because you, the frequency would be lower. So this is, I artificially shifted at a higher frequency. Um, OK, so okay, let's just give 30 seconds. Either works or doesn't, and we are not going to talk about the movies anymore. Oh. <laughs> Although, unfortunately, we are, I've very, already embarrassed myself enough. So. Oh, this works now, too. Wow, amazing. OK. Now I'm so happy. I, 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 don't, I don't know where to start again. OK. <laughs> Let me, OK, I'm just going to do all the, oh? oh. OK, great. Now we just go and do the movies, OK? <laughs> now you know everything. So wait, can I play the game? Yeah, OK. Those are the black holes, although our dance was better, but that's what it was. The two black holes form a black hole. Gravitational waves propagate through space, right? Uh, and I told you, they actually go in, in, the, in the other direction, but that's fine. So propagate at the speed of light, according to Einstein. 
And then they reach, you know, they go through space, and every object they, they encounter, they do this. They stretch the space in one direction and squeeze it in the other. Now, here you say scale of effect vastly exaggerated, meaning we're all uh, still alive. We didn't die through this. And so this, this is actually the actual change that you see is way, way smaller. Fantastic. And now, you know, that's what you would have seen in this slide, is that the gravitational wave propagates, stretches, squeezes space-time as they go. And now here, they are the masses, la, 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 and now you know the story. OK, this is gr the great one that I was trying to explain before. This is the laser. Gravitational laser arrives. The, the, uh, the space in between the, these objects changes. And then what happens is that you, you operate your instrument such that there is no light that goes toward uh, the, the photodetector here where you measure it. But as soon as the gravitational waves arrive, so there is no light now, but now the gravitational waves arrive now. Yes. And then you see some light appears here. And then you put here, again, this object that converts the photons in a signal that you can actually measure. And then the properties of this signal give, have encoded the property of the stretching and squeezing of the space, and therefore the property of the wave. OK. So now, uh, this is what, I mean, I have to say that my performance was not bad, but now you would, you would hear uh, what we detected on September 14. Can you, can you hear the whoop? This is actually, again, it's shifted in frequency such that you can actually hear better. The original sound is at, at a lower frequencies. But so the point here is that You'd say, well, OK, how can you tell from this that these were two, uh, you know, how can, what can you tell from, from these two objects, now, from these two signals? Now, the first thing that we can tell is that they're happening, ex they are exactly the same, and they're happening at the same, uh, at the two observatories. One is, remember, one is in Washington State, the other one is in Louisiana. Einstein told us that the gravitational waves propagate at the speed of light. So the, uh, it, the light takes uh, 10, sec 10 milliseconds to go from one side to another. So in order to even be possible that this is a gravitational wave that you have detected, it needs to happen in within this time window, right? The gravitational wave is, let's say, is up here, right? And it arrives there, it arrives here. It needs to arrive within the time that the light takes to go from there to here. 10 milliseconds between the two observatories. So this is the first indication that it's not really a local uh, thing. It's not something that, you know, some, you know, a car going uh, close to the mirror and shaking the mirrors or something like that, because it needs to happen at the same time at both observatories. The other aspect of this is that this is actually the amplitude of the, uh, of the gravitational waves. Uh, the, what the red one is from the observatory in uh, Washington State. The blue one is from uh, the one in Louisiana. And you see that here they look, they look pretty much the same. One could say, well, I mean, is that really strong, uh, strong enough to make sure that these are really, uh, you know, it's an astrophysical source? It is another kind of incredible thing, and is that that Einstein uh, gave us the recipe for actually calculate what the amplitude of this wave should look like. And so we, we know, or some people know, how to do the calculation. And so they can actually predict what two black holes, uh, you know, what's the gravitational waves produced, uh, what are the gravitational waves produced by the black holes as they merge into each other. And it looks like this. And so here is uh, what, what then what we have done is you say, OK, this is the one that uh, I calculated. And then I try to see uh, how you match the signal uh, that I measured. And it turns out that uh, they worked very incredibly well. So you can tell that this signal was produced by two 
uh, black holes approximately 30 times the mass of the sun that collide in space one billion years ago. And, and then the gravitational waves produced as they collided traveled at the speed of light toward us and we detected. Because by chance, you know, all over during that time, we figured out how to build instruments able to measure it, <laughs> which, is, which is pretty remarkable. Uh, well, we first we the theory and then build the instruments. And then by the time the, the wave arrived to us, we were actually able to measure it. It's, it's incredible. Uh, so if you think about some of what we have learned just by looking at this signal, and, and, and knowing all the, you know, and, and knowing from general relativity uh, what this signal really means, we learn a lot of things. For example, we learned that, uh, told you, uh, these objects were 30 times the mass of the sun, merged 1.3 billion years ago. When they merged, like we did before, uh, they formed a black hole, which is about 60 times the mass of the sun. And this is like the first time that I, uh, you know, we started writing this down. This kind of it made me crazy. So as they merged, the equivalent of three times the mass of our sun was emitted in gravitational waves. Like, think about that. It's, it's, it's crazy. So our sun has lost 0.03% of its mass in 5 billion years through light, through electromagnetic emission. During this black hole merger, three times the mass of the sun was lost in less than a second through gravitational waves. It's incredible. So it's a huge amount of energy. So, and this is something that's very important. The fact that the amplitude of the waves is small, it doesn't mean that there is no energy in these waves. There is a lot of energy. But the space-time is so stiff that even if you dump a huge amount of energy in it, it doesn't stretch and squeeze much. And that's why you need very um, uh, carefully engineered instruments, very big instruments, to make this measurement. So uh, you might have heard of this already, because when did that happen? So September 14, 2015, uh, that was kind of a big deal. And here are some of the um, uh, things that, you know, some of the um, uh, um, front page of, of, of newspapers, Einstein was right. Uh, and uh, actually, at that time, President Obama tweeted about it. Uh, Einstein was right. Congrats to the National Science Foundation and LIGO on detecting gravitational waves. A huge breakthrough in how we understand the universe. So that was a, a great thing. OK. So then. Uh, at that point, like we took data for, uh, so you, we had, remember the story. We had just started taking data with this new instrument. So what we did is we spent a, a couple of extra months taking data. We detected another gravitational waves uh, uh, on the 26th of December. Uh, and then, um, yeah, sorry, I'm a bit confused because this is not actually the latest version of my presentation. So this, this presentation is somewhat cursed. I, I apologize. But so I will, I will go through uh, nevertheless. Um, so we stopped taking data for a while. So we stopped in January uh, of 2016. We, st we stopped for a while. And I, I told you, right, we were still operating our Ferrari, not really like a Ferrari. So the point is, OK, now we stopped and we try to make our instruments better a bit better. And so we started taking data again uh, in November uh, 2016. Uh, the idea was to have something like a six months run. But then as of June of, 2000, of 2017, we have detected only two more black holes, which you could say, well, you have you know, waited a few decades to detect one. It's not like only two more. I mean, what is that? But the truth is, you know, we. We, we were hoping to see more, something different, or more black holes. Uh, and so we decided to extend this observing run by a couple of extra months. Remember, it was June. Uh, and I have to say, we were all a bit depressed. Uh, and then another interesting thing that happens is that on August 1st, 
uh, another instrument to join this observing run, not just the two LIGO detectors, but Virgo as well. Virgo is where I actually started my PhD, is a gravitational wave instrument uh, near Pisa. Looks pretty much like a LIGO detector, it's uh, just shorter, it's a three kilometer instead of four. Why this is important? It's important uh, because if you have three detectors, right, instead of two, uh, that helps you to localize better in the sky where your object is. Uh, you can triangulate. So now if you have a source, let's say, up here on the ceiling, now it's not just that it needs, you know, arrives here and there, but there is another point, let's say, over there. And now I know that the information travels at the speed of light. And so when I, I see um, a source, when I, I listen to a source, uh, with three points, I'm able to reconstruct better where it is in the sky. Uh, and the interesting thing is that just two weeks after uh, Virgo came online, uh, another uh, binary black hole system merged. And this time we could actually tell way better than before where it was in the sky. And this thing is, one could say for, for black holes, is not that important because all the, you know, uh, there are many theories, but the more, more co most common theories tells you that there shouldn't be light emitted when the black holes merge. They are black, uh, the, we don't think there is light associated with them. So it's only the gravitational waves that is emitted. But people started to be excited about this because you say, well, if now I have three gravitational wave detector that can tell me pretty much where my source is in the sky, if it's not from black holes, but it's from something else that actually emits light, then it's a huge thing because now I can tell the telescope, hey, something happened right there. Go, point your telescope over there. And now, you know, this is August 14, uh, 2017. Now, uh, I told you Virgo was online only for two weeks. And so this is where we uh, think that the way in which I, um, Think about this is that uh, um, nature really like gravitational wave science because just three days after that, on August 17, there was another uh, event in the sky. This time, not from a black hole system, but for, for a binary neutron star system. So binary neutron stars are these very interesting objects that are kind of at the end of the life of stars. Uh, and they are objects that are the mass of the sun, but have, have a radius of 10 kilometers. So they are very dense objects, mostly made of, of neutrons. The important point here is that uh, this time when they collide, you expect to see something. Now, first of all, you could say, well, how can you tell that that was a neutron star instead of black, black holes just from the gravitational wave information? And the, way, the reason why we know that is because uh, the way in which the signal looks is very different. So now here, those are all the gravitational wave signals that we have seen. And you, we call them GW for gravitational waves, and then they date. So this one is the first one with the black holes. Uh, and this one is the one that we detected on August 17. And now this scale is time but it's a logarithmic scale, so don't get uh, fooled. Like, this is one second. So the, the gravitational wave signal that we saw at the beginning stayed in the band of our detector uh, for a very short period of time. This one uh, stayed for a long time, for 50 seconds. We could see it going through all across our band. And this is only possible if the objects are much lighter than black holes. And again, thanks to Einstein uh, theory of general relativity, uh, we could actually um, you know, model what the signal should look like. And so again, we could tell the, exactly the mass of these objects. And, and, and this time, thanks to Virgo, we could also see, say, where this object was in the sky. This is not the only, uh, the only story, it's actually, it's even more exciting uh, because two seconds after uh, the LIGO detectors and Virgo saw these signals, 
What happened is a totally independent instrument, it's a Fermi uh, gamma ray burst detector in space that looks for gamma ray burst, also saw something. And now uh, gamma ray burst uh, are, you know, this uh, burst of gamma rays, <laughs> uh, and they happen, they are some of the most uh, energetic events that happens in, in, in our universe. And people have been seeing these things since the 50s, uh, but they never quite understood their origin. Uh, but so the interesting thing is that uh, the LIGO detectors detected gravitational waves. The Fermi detector detected gamma ray, uh, gamma ray burst at the same time. Uh, and this is the first time that something like this happened. It's the first time that you can combine the information uh, to, to really uh, try to see what, what happened. And now, um, this is an artistic representation of what I just said. Those are your going because this is really I didn't know how I could uh, kind of reproduce that <laughs> yeah the music was a bit dramatic uh, so so imagine th this is what would happen in the sky now obviously it's not like we you know we could see that but what we could do uh, is you know Virgo LIGO and the Fermi detector alerted all the instruments uh, many of the instruments on Earth, many telescopes on Earth and in space. Uh, and so what happened, this is, I, I, I hope someone uh, at some point makes a movie or something. Imagine, you know, like you have, I don't know, uh, hundreds of telescopes and uh, they receive a, a, an indication that there is something like what you have just seen happening in the sky. And then you imagine all the telescope doing and moving toward that point, right? It's, it would be a great movie. And so all the telescopes point at that at part in the sky. Uh, and now uh, what happens is that each of these telescopes is sensitive to a different type of light. And so that goes from the, uh, from the visible light, infrared, ultraviolet, and then at the late time, this is days, uh, ra radio and X-ray. So this is really an incredible, uh, an, an incredible combination of information from all the parts of the electromagnetic spectrum combined with the gravitational information. The first time that happened, uh, never happened before uh, in the history of astronomy. Uh, many many images were made of this event. This is a particular one. Uh, which I like, it's from the Hubble Space Telescope. And so what they did, they looked at the image at the time that uh, LIGO, Virgo, and Fermi told them, and then they compared it with previous images. And then what they saw is that, indeed, when they, when they looked up, they saw something that was not there before. So they saw some of the light emitted by uh, the collision of the neutron stars and the formation of the gamma ray burst. That is uh, incredible. And so thanks, so they could tell which is the galaxy from which this event happened. And I could actually um, uh, tell uh, a couple of important things. As I said, the first one is that uh, for the first time, you could say, okay, the gamma ray burst has been produced by a binary neutron star system merging. And this is the definitive link of this connection that we didn't know before. The second one is that uh, from um, the analysis of all of the information that the telescope collected, they could actually uh, uh, understand that when the neutron star merge is also the time in which some of the heavy metals uh, in our universe are produced. So uh, metals like gold and platinum, right? Uh, this, 
thanks to all of this information, they could link uh, directly to the merger of neutron stars. And so there was an Italian newspaper that titled, you know, discover the source of gold in the universe, for example. It was kind of funny too. Uh, but so also this, um, uh, this, this event made the front page because it's uh, really new information that you can, uh, you can understand from that. Okay, um, so I want to tell you now, I want to wrap up this talk, and again, I really apologize because uh, there was a bit of a technical complication here. But I want to try to close to give you uh, really the sense, uh, like if you walk here with one idea, this is the idea that you should have. Um, so in the uh, 1610, um, Galileo, for the first time, pointed a telescope at the sky. Right? Uh, this is about 400 years ago. This is really the telescope that one of the telescopes he uses in a museum in, in Italy, actually. Uh, 400 years later, we are still building uh, telescopes uh, to look at the skies. This is, those are some, only just a fraction of the, of the telescopes that we use today. This is the Hubble uh, Space Telescope. The Hubble Space Telescope has been able to uh, make a picture of an object that uh, is, you know, um, that pretty much is as far as the, can look as far in the universe at the time as the first stars were born, which is incredible. So for 400 years, we have been using light uh, to, to understand our universe. And now, we have not only light, we also have gravitational waves. And so the most important message from, all of, from my story is that now we do have a new messenger, gravitational waves, that combined with the electromagnetic information uh, can give us great insight about what's happening in the universe. And I have described only a very particular uh, type of gravitational waves that we can measure from the ground. And so here, if you imagine the frequency of your gravitational waves, uh, this is about uh, uh, 100 hertz, one kilohertz. This is where uh, the, the uh, interferometers like LIGO operates here. Uh, but the gravitational waves uh, are pretty much all the frequency down to a very, very low frequency. And now, the same way in which we build the telescopes for different wavelength of light, we can do the same thing. And in fact, those are images of instruments that are either built or are designed. Uh, the one that I prefer is called LISA, like me, uh, and is the Laser Interferometer Space Antenna. It's, up, it's uh, scheduled to, uh, to launch in a, uh, something like 15 years, I think. Uh, and this object, for example, would go in space. So imagine a giant interferometer that goes in space. Uh, and by collecting the information from all of these instruments uh, that, uh, that are uh, sensitive in particular frequency band, we can look at a bunch of uh, different types of objects in the, in the universe. So we have been talking about uh, black holes and, and neutron stars, but there are other type of objects, uh, even like more massive black holes, for example, or spinning neutron stars, objects like this that can produce a wide variety of gravitational waves. And now we have the tool to measure it. And uh, for uh, people like me, it's almost uh, incredible to think that you are part, it's really, we feel like the first time that Galileo Looked at, the, looked at the sky for the first time. It's really a privilege to be part of the community now because we can only imagine what we could do if we are able to build, for example, bigger instruments for gravitational waves detections on the, that can also, like the Hubble telescope, reach uh, the edge of the universe. And so we could see pretty much all the gravitational waves that are out there. Uh, and so this is uh, really incredible. Thank you all for your attention. Okay.
I have a lot of questions, but I, I feel like I shouldn't ask them. But what I want to do is to have you ask questions. Only from the cartoon, you mean? I think, uh, yeah, I understand your question. So the, the, it's a very good question. The, the correct way of thinking about uh, the laser is not really like a ruler in which you say, I have my wave and I compare it with the distance. Uh, it's more like a clock. So uh, the way in which you need to think about this is that as your gravitational waves arrives, uh, the distance between your mirrors changes in one direction, get longer in one direction and shorter in the other. So what happens is the arrival time of the photons that have traveled from your mirror back changed. And that's the right way. So it's not really a ruler, it's a clock. Yeah. And yeah, the choice of the, gra of the wavelength of the laser are actually determined by um, a lot of, of uh, technical aspects. So, like you know, how powerful of a laser you can, you can make, how stable it is, and the coding for the meters, and all of this. Yeah. Hello. Um, these are waves in space-time, right? All the, all the drawings, all the pictures show us space. There must be waves or, you know, expansion, contraction taking place in time also. And, and how is that handled? Yeah, no, it's true. It's just, it's very hard to draw anything in four dimensions. <laughs> I think that's the answer. So, and, and but no, no, but you're right, but that's exactly the same, the same argument that we are making. You know, you would need a clock there as well uh, to, to really explain this. But the clock speeds up and slows down as the waves go through it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. One of your early uh, equations showed uh, the amplitude being created by a whole string of uh, components. How do you tell what the relative masses are of the two pieces that merge? I know that the initial one was 62 uh, solar masses. How do you know one was 30 and one was 28? Yeah, no, that's... One was 55 and one was 4? Oh, it's, it's a very good question. So the answer is that... Um, so the way in which we figure out what the parameters are, really, it's something like you simulate what the gravitational waves of all of these ratio of masses is. Indeed, we have, I don't know what, like 10 to the 5 templates, 100,000 templates of objects in which you, you, know, you really simulate a mass of, for example, one solar mass black holes and two solar mass black holes, what happens there, and so on, right? And at this point, you have, uh, you can calculate accurately what the waves look like, and then you match it with the wave that you actually measure. And from that, you extract the parameters. And the accuracy is such that you can actually distinguish uh, these elements. Your, your wave would look totally different if the masses were different. And we, we have uh, the, uh, that precision in the, in the measure. It's not incredibly precise. If you actually look at the paper, you can see the error bar. And so there is an error in there. But it's, it's pretty accurate. Yeah. Um, 
So the concept is relatively simple. It's a pendulum. So uh, let's try this. Uh, okay, so I can, so depending on which frequency I move the, the top with respect to my pendulum, this moves more. But if I go higher frequency, I'm, an idea, I, I'm cheating here, let's keep it fixed. If I do that at higher frequency of the typical uh, uh, resonance of this pendulum, the bottom doesn't move much or move, move much less. So that's the concept. And so what we do is we, maybe there is a cleverer way, but what we do is we have a cascade of this pendulum, one after the next. And so what happens is the top of your pendulum is actually attached to the ground, like we have some sort of a cage that keeps this mirror up. So your top is attached to the ground, and then you do this, and then here, instead of your mirror, you just have a mass and then another pendulum afterwards, and so on. And we do this four times. And so what happens is that when you move the top at, at a frequency which higher than the resonance frequencies of this object, uh, it, this doesn't move. And so the, the result is that above 10 hertz, the seismic noise is completely filtered out. Indeed, we call it the seismic wall, meaning below 10 hertz is very, very hard to make a measurement on the ground because the, the ground moves too much. So the concept per se is very simple. Now the engineering is very complicated because these mirrors are 40 kilograms, right? So they're, and they're 34 centimeter in diameter. So it's an object like this. Um, and then you suspend it, you know, through this cascade of pendulum. And actually at the top, we have active seismic isolation where we build an object in which we measure how much the, the mirror, sorry, the, the ground is, is shaking and we correct for that. So we have this cascade of system, and at the end, uh, at frequencies above this, again, above 10 hertz, the seismic noise is completely filtered out. This took several decades of development, and uh, the original concept of the suspensions come from uh, UK, actually. Um, I had heard that, and I don't know if this is so, but that there had been some system of introducing like uh, blind data into the LIGO system in order to prevent false positives. And I was wondering if you could talk about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's a very good question. So uh, in, 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 in the talk, I, I spent most, I didn't spend a lot of time explaining how we extract uh, the information, you know, how we analyze the signal. But um, in order to make sure that the entire sequence works well, like that all our data analysis system works correctly. What has been done several years ago was that uh, someone in the collaboration, typically the, the, the PI and the observatory's head, would inject a signal with fake gravitational waves uh, signal. So they would uh, intentionally uh, create a signal that looks like a gravitational wave by shaking the mirrors a bit. Um, and they would do that without uh, not telling anyone in the collaboration. So this was done, uh, for example, in one of the observing run uh, with the old instruments before we put the advanced LIGO instruments in. Uh, and the, the, that was an exercise for the collaboration. So what we had to do was to uh, do all the analysis down to the end, up to writing a paper, right? Uh, and, and then I, I still remember when we opened the box, which was an envelope really, uh, in, in that was saying if there was a gravitational waves, a real gravitational waves or one injected, right? And so I remember, you know, we were there with champagne and all ready to celebrate. That, that's a true story. Uh, but then what happened is that the, the envelope said it was a blind injection. Uh, and no one knew except uh, very few people. Now, uh, so when, you know, the, the first black holes uh, was, uh, first the gravitational waves from the first black holes was observed, uh, some people, even in the collaboration, thought, wait, this is, you know, this signal is huge. 
I didn't go too much in the detail, but the ratio between the noise of the instrument and the amplitude of your signal uh, is, is more than 20. So the amplitude of the gravitational waves is small, but the noise in your instrument is also very small. And so this signal was, was really big. And in fact, a friend of mine was like, hey, what did you do? Did you, see, you know, you as instrumentalist, you injected the signal so big, you think we, we don't know how to do our job? It was so big, obviously we, we, we were able to find it, right? Uh, but the reality is that this event happened so quickly, just a couple of days after we have turned on the instrument, we were not ready to do blind injection. So we were not, we were not prepared to do it. We didn't know, it's crazy, but we didn't know how to shake the mirrors <laughs> to produce this event. That's, uh, that's the thing. And so then what happened is that we decided that nature had provided a blind injection that have shown that all the data analysis was done correctly. And so since then we have decided not to do blind injection anymore. We've used the natural uh, injections from, yeah. What would you say um, is the ultimate goal of gravitational wave astronomy? I mean, what is it that you really want to find out? And uh, second part of that is, um, and we should care about this because. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, so I think the, the, the main reason is that, um, but two reasons. The first one is that gravitational waves brings you unique information that light doesn't bring you. So we can combine the two information and we get more insight. For example, now we know how the neutron starts, uh, what happens exactly, in the, what's the mechanism by which, for example, these heavy metals are formed and all of that. But I think the even more interesting aspect is that there are some astrophysical objects that for example, merging of black holes that we, didn't, we wouldn't know about because we wouldn't have any telescope able to detect those. In fact, we didn't even know that binary black hole system existed and they merged in a time that uh, you know, was comparable with the, with, age, with the age of the universe. So I think the answer to your question is that it's a complete new tool that allows you to study things that you couldn't study before. And I talked only about LIGO, but there are instruments that, for example, are trying to measure uh, the, uh, the primordial uh, stochastic background. And so that, for example, is the unique way of probe as close as possible to the Big Bang, that we have no other way of doing with light, because the information from light is lost from the, from the Big Bang. Uh, so I, that's, that's the, they are unique, they are unique messenger. Uh, from from the universe. So I think maybe in one word, uh, the re, you know the reason why I do this and other people do this is because um, we will learn more. We will learn more about our universe. We actually don't know much uh, much about it. And so this is uh, that's why we say it's a new era. We have a new tool. It's like adding a sense to you know uh, to the human body. Hello, Lisa. Thank you, Lisa, for the great talk. Uh, could you please elaborate on another Lisa, which is the next generation gra uh, gravitational wave observatory? Sorry, say again? Another li Lisa. The other Lisa, yeah. not me. The one, yeah. So, yeah, that's, um, that's actually uh, very exciting. So, uh, Lisa is a space mission. And, and so, the, what uh, they just did a test in 2015. 2015, by the way, was a great way for gravitational wave astronomy because LISA had a Pathfinder mission in which they tested the technology uh, on just one uh, spacecraft. So the idea they will have two, uh, sorry, three uh, uh, spacecraft going in space in a triangular shape, right? And so what they will do is uh, the concept is similar to the one of the interferometer, in which will have a laser beam and they will measure you know, the, the, the laser from one space station to the next and so on. And then as the gravitational waves arrive, they change. Uh, the concept is very similar. Now, the difference is that 
the main one is that if you go in space, ground shaking is not a problem for you. Maybe you have other problems, but you need to get up there. Uh, but the ground doesn't shake. And so this wall of 10 Earths that I told you, in which um, now it limits the ability of, for ground-based observation, you don't have that anymore. What that means is that the frequency at which the object merge uh, can become lower and lower, and you will, you will see it. And what that means, again, is that you can have, for example, very massive black holes that they will merge at a frequency below 10 Hz when LIGO wouldn't see it, but LISA would see it. And so that's the, that's the great thing, is that the totally complementary uh, instrument that target a different, different astrophysical object. And then some people are now thinking about, great, how we combine the information between the ground-based instruments and the space instruments. For example, um, there could be some objects that LISA sees and they won't merge in the LISA band because they will merge in the LIGO band. But LISA could tell LIGO and Virgo, hey, look, in you know, a few years, you will get the signal over there, that kind of thing. So people are just started studying uh, the synergy between these instruments. But, but we will need all of them. For each frequency, it's like the wavelength of light. For each frequency, you will need dedicated instrument that target that, that frequency. So, um Sorry, I'm going to ask people who still have questions to come up after. I want to thank Lisa for a fantastic talk. Really sorry because I had to improvise a lot. Oh, I actually think it's better you. to do it uh, bodily first and then with the yeah. movie. Um, and thank so you to you my black hole partner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you have any questions, please come up.